Um, so <laughs> just a, a quick refresher, welcome to the Wednesday night live stream and today it's all about testing your water. Um, now if you want to keep a happy tank, happy reef, you're keeping water. So if your water's happy, everything's good, your tank's also good. Um, now the mysterious voice in the background is Mr. Paul from Reef Community Reef. Worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so what we're just kind of talking about is the main thing that you want to test in your reef tank. Number one is you want to make sure you're testing your salinity. There's a few different ways to do this. Um, the most common is probably a refractometer. Um, that's the little kind of crystal in there. You put a couple drops of salt water on it, hold it up to light, and see the value is. Now, they're fairly inexpensive. I mean, you can pick one up for about $30 or so. But the past year or two, they've really started coming out with lots of different digital ones. Um, and so far, my kind of go-to has been the Hanada Salinity Checker. Uh, Paul was just saying with yours. Paul, how often do you calibrate yours? I, I wouldn't calibrate it as often. Mm -hmm. but I, I was getting like, when I do a water change, I just like to make sure it's 100% accurate as I'm doing the water and I, and I put the, like, the salt into the water. Mm -hmm. So if I do that and I'm doing a big water change, say 100 litres, 200 litres, that, that's what's that, 30, 40 gallons. Mm -hmm. I prefer to know it's perfect, so then I'll calibrate it. Okay, nice. So, based on how to do water changes, and I guess that's how often you calibrate it. <laughs> Recently, mm -hmm. I've been doing multiple water changes because my tank's been... I've, I've, I've changed elements, so I was mm -hmm. using... Tri I've, I've gone from Triton to ATI. Yeah. So, I've been doing multiple water changes to mm -hmm. kick it into the ATI parameters. Okay. So, over the last, I'd say, two months, I've done about three big water changes. And I've that's calibrated it twice within that two months. Okay, so every month. Yeah, you could say like, okay. every month I've been doing it up to you. Monthly is just kind of what I've rationed is kind of a good way to do it. The uh, other one, when, you, when, when you're talking about doing your salinity, people need to realize all the water that's in the skimmer cup is salt water. Mm -hmm. So when you empty that, preferably you could do it putting that much water back into your system. Well, one. So I'm a big fan of doing a dry skim, and that's for one of the reasons is you're taking out less salt water for your tank. Yeah. Over time, if you don't do water change, you don't do corrective stuff, it is going to slowly shift over time, especially yeah. if you do a really wet skim. Now, yeah. something to consider is a lot of other parameters are based off your salinity. If your salinity is off, it's going to throw off, you know, almost every other parameter. So that's one you got to check on. And, you know, in my earlier days, that's one of those things I got lazy on. I didn't check it for ages, had a bunch of tank issues, and I checked one. And I'm like, oh, my salinity's way up. Look at that. That's what I don't get for checking it for like six months. Well, so. last, 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 was it December? In, mm -hmm. in December, November, December, the corals, like a few of the corals died, like a few of the colonies. Oh, yeah. For no, for no apparent reason whatsoever, as mm -hmm. I thought anyway. So that happened. A few corals started turning brown. So I, I, I was wondering, and I bought the Hanna checker. Mm -hmm. So I calibrated it, put it in, and it was reading really high. So I rang Reefing with more, saying, my uh, salinity pen's broken. <laughs> yeah. And he's going, well, it's not broken. You've calibrated it. That's how it should be. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, no, because I've got my Milwaukee here, and that's reading it's right. This is reading it's wrong. Because if you calibrated your Milwaukee, I said, no. And I realized that my salinity was like knocking on 41 PPT. Look at chunk, that's up there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, sp speaking of reefing with though, he just met, commented he calibrates his every three months and it's been spot on every time I tested. So, here's whole yeah. calibration very well. Right on the money. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, got our salinity down. Most important thing to check. You know, got your salinity, you make sure your temperature's in range, hands down the basics. Sky High Reef hydrometer for five years now. So, you got the floaty bob hydrometers. Those things are rubbish. They can work, but they're not accurate. You got the scientific little bobber ones, which are accurate, but they're a lot trickier to use and they're not cheap for the good ones. So, fractometer or digital ones, definitely the way to go. Um, I like this one because it tells you the temperature as well. So, you got your temperature and your salinity on it. So, it's kind of a double check, quick and easy. Now, aside from that, Next, big important things to test are going to be your calcium, elk, and magnesium for a reef tank. Actually, even before that, um, brand new tank, you ammonia, so kind of nitrogen cycle. I'm only brought this up because I've recently been testing it like crazy because I cycled my rock very recently uh, prior to Christmas for the new tank. 
I had the rock cycling in salt water since prior to Christmas. Been in the tank now. And just the other day, I added tons of fish to the tank. So I also dumped in copious amounts of bacteria to it. So I used the Brightwell XLM to cycle my rock. Um, everything was cycled before I had a fish. I added a ppm or two of ammonia and to the tank, and then I tested it. So I tested my ammonia 24 hours later. It was down to 0.04. Test again the next day, completely gone. So it was a kind of a test to make sure that the tank can handle the fish load. Um, then just for kind of contingency, I added a ton more bacteria the next day when I actually added it to it. So for cycling a tank, if you're brand new, so the first thing you're going to care about is going to be your ammonia. Um, after that, once your bacteria is established, the ammonia is going to transfer into nitrites, which is NO2, and then from there it's going to translate it to NO3. At that point, your tank's cycled, you're happy. You're likely not going to use the ammonia and nitrite test because very often once your tank is cycled and established, if something was to die or bite the dust in your tank, maybe that's a point you want to check it and make sure there's no big impact. But the side of it, a mature tank can handle all of that. <laughs> um, so once you have coral in the tank, alkalinity is by far the most important thing you want to test on the tank. If I'm repeating, I apologize. If I'm not, I'm not putting anything else on by my keyboard again. Um, so the alkalinity... And the biggest thing is when you test it, you need to test it within the same time every single day. Uh, your coral growth and your uptake is going to be tied to your photo period. So if you're testing in the morning, the next day you test it at night, it's going to be off of what it would be. So pick a time, test that consistently every day. Um, now this is generally something you want to do when you first set up your dosing. Uh, once you're dosing, everything is kind of tuned in, then you can be a little more lax and you'll know, maybe start going once a week, maybe every Tuesday, good old test Tuesday, um, or every Sunday or whatever it is, you test on a weekly basis. Now, one thing that's often overlooked by a lot of people is magnesium. It doesn't fluctuate very much until it does, and then it kind of like tanks down on you. And magnesium is kind of like the reef keeper. It, it keeps the balance between calcium and alkalinity. So it is one that you should pay attention to. I know with my calcium reactor, that was one thing I didn't test enough because it can, you can add mag rocks, but I find it's never quite enough. So it's something every once in a while I'd have to dose and kind of tweak things back into this, this place. Well, I think it is with magnesium. When you've got magnesium, mm -hmm. if, if people have magnesium, it's consistently high, say around 1500. Yep. I, I don't need to worry about it. Mm -hmm. the, the reason I would say they won't have to worry about it because it's not swinging. Mm -hmm. If it's stable and it's got its sweet spot, leave it there. Don't yeah. try to drag it down by not dosing it and or putting loads into it to, to raise it up. If it's got that sweet spot and it's staying there constantly, mm -hmm. that's your sweet spot. And you yep. don't need to play with it. Exactly. So biggest thing, hands down, stability, right? Yeah. I think yeah. what it is, a lot of people do chase the numbers. Mm -hmm. they, they, don't, they, re they need to realize... If it balances out at a certain, like, a certain one, like same with your calcium and your KH, if it balances out at 7.6 mm -hmm. and your, your magnesium is high, a little bit high, but your calcium is balancing at 420 yep. and they're there for a, a, a consecutive period, mm -hmm. leave it there. Don't try to raise it up a little bit to get it to 440 and raise it up to get it to 8. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Just, I think that's why a lot of people try they chase because, it. Yeah, they, they, they chase it because everybody tells them to do that. Everyone says, yeah. oh, it should, it should be eight. But you start raising your cage, your, your calcium drops, your magnesium starts to swing, and everything goes in. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that, that balance is, is a good little thing. Now, a lot of people worry about what their numbers should be. Um, what the actual number in doesn't necessarily matter all that much. Like As long as they're within the general ranges, what matters is that they're stable and that you keep it there. And long term, that's what's going to get you successful. Like you could, your L could be seven, it could be ten. It doesn't matter. Pick somewhere and keep it there. That's a big important thing that a lot of people. Your test will tell you if mm -hmm. you're right because, like I said, if you test it and then the week later it's the same, that's mm -hmm. your sweet spot. Exactly. Keep it there. Um, another question I get constantly is like, "What salt do you use? What is this?" Like, it doesn't necessarily make a huge difference. Like, your salt isn't going to make or break your reef tank. Um, I always tell people, you know, pick one that matches your parameters and use that. Yeah. That's the biggest thing you could do. Um, the main justification for that is if you do a big water change and there's a big swing in your parameters or salt, like some of the brands have elevated levels, it's going to do cause a big swing in your tank, which is bad. You don't want to cause swings, right? You want to be stable as possible. 
So at yeah. the end of the day, look at the parameters on the bucket. If it's close to your tank, it's probably a good option for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, like I'm using the Brightwell one right now. It's lower on the elk, which I like because some of them are super duper elevated, which I don't really see a big value in that. If you don't dose your tank and you're relying strictly on water changes, then that might be a reason for you. Um, if you ha if you have like LPS or something else and it slowly drags it down throughout the week, then you do water change and bumps it back up. But in order for you to get all your nutrients out of water changes, you need to do a fairly substantial water change. So it only kind of works in small tanks with large water changes. Otherwise, I would start looking at dosing. Yes. Okay. Now, to dose, when you are actually doing a test, you need to do it accurately. Now, so most of the time, you take your water sample, you pull it to whatever mills the test requires, and you follow the little lines. It works. Just going to show you guys this super cool thing I picked up recently. Whoop, it's like a little calibrated pipette. So you can you get your little wheel here and you can pick whatever you want. So you can be like, oh, I'd like to dose 2.5 or I'd like 1.8 mils. So super cool. I've looked at these for ages and I was watching a live stream with Jake and Chris on the other day and they, they talked about them. I'm like, I'm going to get one. I ordered one off Amazon. But you're like, oh, I need exactly six mils. Do you so know, what, if you do that and you put it into the vial of the, yep. the anavials. Yes. Does it go perfectly to the meniscus line? Um, I will try it later. Do you know that'll be that'll be a good thing to see if you like if it's if it's very accurate like that. That'll be a good thing to see. It is because I did test in a graduated cylinder earlier with like I was like oh five point five mils and it was like basically dead on. So super cool device. And if you're like hardcore, you want to test a bunch of different stuff, so you push the little eject button. It's like <laughs> pop on your what's new it, What's it called? It is called the Micro Lift RBO. It's between, it actually goes higher, but the label says one to 10 mils. There's a link in the description. I put to the one I actually bought, but you guys want to check it out, but super cool. I bought like a hundred pack of things too, so you can pop them off if you want, but it's just a nice way to be consistent because if you test and you're not consistent, you pull a different millimeters of water every time, or, you know, oh, you dump in a little too much reagent, your test could be off. And maybe your your tank is stable, but you're messing with it because your testing procedure isn't stable, right? So the biggest thing is you being consistent in how you test the tank. And then for me, um, most of the time I use automated testers, but when I do test stuff, especially doing with ammonia and all my cycling, different stuff, this way I know it's a perfect sample and it's not my water level that's throwing off my test during my sample. So I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool. I think they're about 55 US, not the cheapest, but realistically... It's going to keep all my tests super stable then i don't know it's a good investment on kind of keeping consistent long term uh mark d hi my kh change due day i'm around 10 any around 10 a.m 8.24 4 p.m 7.8 is this normal um so that's your corals sucking up through the day now the biggest thing is um it very well could be sucking up that much if you are dosing your tank, then I would try and, you know, might want to up your dosing a little bit during that period. That's one way you can do it. But the biggest thing for me is a little bit of swings throughout the day and the end of the world. But if I test at 10 a.m. today and I test 10 a.m. tomorrow, I want those numbers to be pretty darn close to the identical. And once they are, then, you know, your dosing is kind of dialed in. What a lot, what a lot of people do, they'll, they'll test their systems in the morning and they'll mm -hmm. test it at night and they'll realize that it's... Oh, well, saying that if you test it in the morning, test it mm -hmm. midday, and test it at night, you'll see that it's lower, higher, lower. So some people only dose during the day. So if you're dosing 10 mils of just a triton of each, mm -hmm. they'll dose that during the day when it's consuming it. And they yep. won't dose it at night because it's not consuming it. Yeah, that's true. You can dial in your dosing. Um, I won't be able to show my phone easily. But so I have, like, for instance, on the Mobius app, for the versus there's an automatic mode and it automatically throws in depending on what you're doing like elk and calcium at certain blocks of the day what they think is more optimal for dosing it if yeah. you use the auto mode so same thing right like there are certain periods where they're more likely to uptake more you can dose around it or you can kind of level it out and dose consistently throughout the day sure. now so testing your water so you can 100 percent do it manually i mean the other kind of big trend of the year that i've seen has been all the automated testers now, I've been a bit of a slacker on the testing in the past, so I'm a huge fan of the automated testers. I still definitely do a bit of manual testing here and there, but for the most part, I, I do like the auto testers because it makes life easy. <laughs> Talk about iodine. 
Iodine is something I don't test often. And that's because the test kit is a pain in the butt to do. So, but you've yes. got the salivert one. The salivert one. Is it good? It's only three drops of one and three drops of the other and wait three minutes or something like that. That's not bad. I think it was, I had the Red Sea one. It was like dose C's and I think that was the one you had to run it through a little filter and wait 10 minutes. And I was like, ah, it's too yeah. much effort. It didn't happen nearly enough as it should have. Yeah, the Salafer, the one it's, I think it's like twice, twice as expensive as the rest of the kits. Yeah. But I don't think you need to do it as much, you know, it'll last mm -hmm. a lot longer. So, but it is easier. But I think mm -hmm. iodine is one that a lot of people don't test for, which is another major one that is, is needed to be tested for. Yeah. No, it's true. I should test that one more. It's a good point. <laughs> but like I said, I was like, I think I wrote it in the chat before, carbon sucks your ID out of your system at a mm. fast rate. So if you change your carbon, it can whap all the ID out of your system. Good to know. So how often, so, you, do, how often are you dosing ID in your system? Me, I do. We, I've got the I've got the strong one. Mm -hmm. so let me just get the name of it. I think there's different brands of it. I think this is the Brightwells. Okay. Lugols. Lugols. Is it yeah. iodine or iodide? This is I or something. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Okay. Fair enough. Do <laughs> um, <laughs> you dose that once a week? Iodine. This is iodine. Iodine. Do you notice yeah. a difference when you dose it? When I when I bought this and I started doing it, oh, uh, I changed I changed to ATI, mm -hmm. and then I started dosing this around the same time. I, do, I changed ATI, so if it could be this, it could be that. I changed that, but the corals have gone from looking brown and crappy mm -hmm. to absolutely amazingly popping the beautiful. Nice. So, but I I put about four drops of this in because it's really strong. Mm -hmm. I put four drops of this in a week. Now, do you dose any other trace elements or just the iodine? iodine? This, like, over, over the last say, couple of years, I've sent four ICP tests off, and my tank seems to use, I, it's always low in iodine and strontium. Mm -hmm. So I've I put four drops of this in a week, and strontium is the strong one again, and I put four drops of that in a week. Okay. Strontium was one, I think it was strontium was one that I was low on with the calcium reactor, and there was one other one. What was it? Might have been iodine. Those are two that have historically been kind of low from calcium reactor only, at least for me. And again, it's if you run carbon in your system, the mm -hmm. it takes them out. So I, what I suggest to people, if they are going to run carbon, run mm -hmm. it for, say, four days, yep. but make sure that you top it, your, your iodine and strontium back up afterwards. So only run carbon for four days? Car carbon... I think it's been proven and it's been tested. This I think this papers on it saying that after four days, it's usually depleted. So here's the question. Now I historically throw it in and just only change it every like six weeks. So I just leave it in there though. But uh, do you know what? It's very porous and it's uh, mm -hmm. fil filtration after it's used up. So yeah, so it works. I don't see why I, I do the same. In fact, I took mine out today. Woody told me to take it out today actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. Yeah. Are you still rolling the Miracle Man in the reactor? Nope. No, at the minute, I've got nothing in the, the sump. I've just got the skimmer and the clarity. That's it. Yeah, that's okay. it. Straight from the clarity's open. Skimmer's running really dry. I've got no nitrates or phosphates in my system. So mm -hmm. I'm manually dosing them and all. Quick shout out Miter <clears throat> Sangrita. When I nan super chat, having a mini ocean in the house brings me alive. It is awesome. I realized that the tank is tied to the mood to an extent. If the tank's looking good, you're just happier, it's a good day. All correlates. Is that a Duncan? Yes, yes it is. That is the Duncan in the lagoon right beside me now. So I have a little camera on the tank. I'm just like randomly picking different corals as like live backgrounds for the stream. It's kind of fun. Boop boop. Hey, there it is, a little delayed pop-up. A rat. Uh, that build is too perfect. I'm actually debating doing a custom sump on the new one. I've been potentially looking, getting a quote on a Geo one, because I like how you can get all built in and lids and all the containers and kind of keeps all the moisture, everything contained. And we'll see. That may or may not happen. I've been toying with this idea. Always wanted one, so we'll see. Um, so Jamie, is Carpet Media Reactor considered a must-have or nice-to-have tool? It nice is. Nice to have. Yeah, it's nice to have. You don't need it. 
It is a tool to put in medium. You could throw a media bag into your sump, into a sock or wherever, it'll still work. The only advantage of running it through a media reactor is it's more consistent or more effective, I guess, because you're forcing the water through it rather than it potentially bypassing around it. Yeah, more, more water is going to pass through it with, yeah. with, within the 24 hour period. Mm -hmm. So it's just a more efficient way of doing it. 100% um, don't need it though. Most of the stuff on our tanks we don't need, it's nice to have. Um, now for what you actually put in the reactor, usually is carbon and or sometimes GFO. And <laughs> your son gives me anxiety. <laughs> um, <laughs> so most people use carbon. For me, it's kind of like if it smells a bit fishy. Ah, look at the clown poking above my head. Um, so most of the time carbon is... If I get any like funky, fishy, or shiny smells, then I'll be like, all right, I'll throw some carbon in. And that's basically how I judge mine. Um, GFO is something if you had higher phosphates, it's a tool to do it. GFO, you definitely don't want to use too much. Less is more with GFO. So you can add a bit into it and help kind of slowly creep it down. Uh, ideally, I find if you have a refugium, then that's kind of has worked for me. The refugium is a decent light, and it's going to suck up a lot of your nitrous phosphates for you. It's one thing I've always said that with GFO, a, one spoonful, a little, a little spoonful over a short period of time is better mm -hmm. than a load to strip it all out at once. Yeah. Um. So too much GFO, GFO is very efficient at removing phosphates. So too much of it can actually strip it down to zero, and if it hits zero, then that is bad. So <laughs> it will starve out your corals. So your corals need nitrates and phosphates. Um. Sorry, I'm just laughing at Reefaholics. He says my, my sump stresses him out because of that little crack that I fixed. Um, I am debating a custom acrylic one, so it might happen. Can you start a fund for a new sump? You're mighty kind, thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I've I've been talking about it a little bit, so it might happen. Maybe in a couple months, we'll see. They're not cheap, but they'd be sexy. <laughs> yeah, so GFO, less is more, 100%. Don't want to overdo it. There is other stuff you can use, like lanthium chloride. I've personally never used that one, but it's kind of a liquid that you can dose and very predictable when it binds a certain amount of phosphates to it. I find that very, 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 very effective. Yeah. Do you use it or have you used it? I, I've, I've got it here. I can't use it now because I've got no phosphates. But That's a good reason. With the, clar with the filter, with the Clarice filter, mm -hmm. I literally drip it inside the Clarice filter with it shut. Yeah. So it, as it rises, it's catching all the particles within the clarison filter perfect so i think that way is perfect so most okay so with lanthium chloride um you always do want to dose it within a filter either a sock or a roller or whatnot because you want to get those particles out of the water um i have heard stories that some certain fish are more sensitive to those little particles so always a good idea to run it through some kind of a physical mechanical filtration i think you better off putting it into the into the sock 100 percent uh mike still buying water from the lfs will water changes mess up parameters since not consistent also dosing nano tanks unwise uh it is definitely wise to dose a tank if you're seeing your parameters swing now you're not going to know if they swing unless you test so if you test your alkalinity for instance you know test it on a sunday test it next sunday and if there's more than you know half to point one of a dkh swing then i would start to think of maybe it's a good idea to start dosing um, now you're saying you're buying your water from your LFS, which hundred percent can, but it's also a lot of work. So for me, it is hundred percent worth having an RODI filter in your house because your automatic top off water, you're mixing up salt water. It's easy to have it on hand. You're not hauling buckets in your car into the store and back. Like it's a lot of work. Um, and if something happens in your tank, you need to do a water change. You need to make water quickly. What if your store's not open? Like, there's all these little scenarios, right? Where if you don't have it on hand. So being able to make yours on home, you know, saves the back. You're more prepared for any emergency things. You know, if you have one of those little brute garbage cans, you can have your own little reservoir ready to roll for whenever you need it. So it's a really good way to do it. I don't think LFSs are consistent with water either. Yeah. So the, 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 like the salinity can be higher, it can be lower. It can mm -hmm. use a different salt, which is different parameters completely. Yep. Um, okay, so Reef and Rhino said that he's dosed two part into a five gal before. Oh yeah, so that's fine. I don't know if you're talking about pre-dosing your water change to make a level. You can do that. Some people definitely do. Um, or just dosing a little nano tank. Either will work. But yeah, you got to be fairly precise on dosing, especially on a tiny scale. Now, 
if you one kind of little hack or trick is if you do have a tiny tank and if you're just running a cheapo job doser like a jbo or something that may not be quite as precise and accurate you can always dilute it down so if you know you need to dose half a mil maybe you make it 50 percent water and then you can dose a mil uh, you know to get those micro doses so you can kind of cheat a little bit with cheaper do dosers one way you can do it if you if you're doing a water change in your system and it's a smaller tank for one mm -hmm. and you're dosing try to dose to the level of the salt so the salt's 8 dkh you run it at 8 dkh if your calcium is 440 run it at 440 so when you do mm -hmm. a water change you're not going to get that swing Mm, yes, wise, wise. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, swings are bad. <laughs> so stability really is the name of the game. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a nano or a massive tank. Either way, they are definitely end of the day. It's all about keeping things stable. Let me see this eighteen gallon nano here. What, I, yep. what I've noticed if if it's running ten mil in an eighteen gallon nano and it's not highly full of SPS. Mm -hmm. He should try to dose just during the day when it's consuming it, because mm -hmm. he could be dosing ten mil, and if he's dosing at night, it'll just it, you could just be wasting it in a way. Oh, could be ten mil I, core I, seven is quite a bit, especially in an eighty gallon. I, I tried it and I changed mm -hmm. so just during the day, and yep. I ended up dropping. I ended up dropping mine from sixteen mil. I was dosing, and I went down to about thirteen, just by doing it during the day and not at night. Really, eh? Just from changing the time. Just ah. from changing the time. Crazy. All right, since I see Terrence in the chat, and since I also see a question about the Salinity monitoring probe uh, on the Apex. Okay, so Salinity probe on the Apex, biggest thing is it's very susceptible to interference. So make sure the wire for it is away from all your other power wires. Could be DC pumps, doesn't matter. Anything else, it's very susceptible to interference. So run it, keep a space between other things, and it's going to be more accurate. So pro tip with that one. I've heard that putting elements in your system and all that can change that is that right um possibly it, a lot of them use conductivity i know for instance with the hana i've heard some people say that it could be the reading could be off based on if you're dosing like a two-part or certain thing so if you pop in your tank you may get a different reading from if it was like a separate bucket of fresh to mix salt water now i i personally have not experienced this but i have heard of other people that have had that issue so because it's conductivity, if you're putting all these other particles in your water that mess with the conductivity, you might be reading something that's not just your salt and salinity. So it is a possibility. With the calcium reactor, though, I haven't experienced that. Uh, my nano for dosing, I dose such a small amount, I don't think it has much of a effect. So personally, I haven't had an issue with that one. So that David says that, he says, I dose more during the day, yep. two to three a day, and a third at night. What I try to do is dose it during the day, see if you can lower it. You can, mm -hmm. you know I mean? Yep. Because it does seem like a lot, a real lot. It really does to me for a nano, unless it's just like just every inch full of pack full of acros. Yeah. Yep. Um, test your water before doing anything. So, exactly. Okay, so if something's off with your tank, testing water is always good. Now, the other thing is too, if you test your tank and something is off, the question is, did you bugger up the test? Is it you that makes your parameters off? So in those, before you panic and do stuff, you know, it is potentially worth doing a retest. There's stuff, you know, can the test gets, can expire, you can get bad batches. So there is lots of different potential things. So it's always a good way to do that extra verification before you do any kind of drastic changes to your tank. I was talking to someone the other day and I was talking about these auto, auto door, these, what, what, what's the one you've got? Uh, I have an Alcatronic and I have a Reefbot right now right, for the so automated ones. Let's just say Reefbot for, mm -hmm. for stars. Yep. The new one's going to come out. It's going to be a few thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And someone was talking, I was talking to someone over there and I said to him, I said, why not just send an ICP team, an ICP test off every month for years? Oh, I know you're talking to you. had the same conversation. <laughs> yeah. It was me that told him. Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And I said that, and he, he said, you know what, you're right. Yeah. So you could do your basic tests during the mm -hmm. week, once a week. You could send an ICP test off every single month, get a purely accurate reading. Mm -hmm. Why would people not do that instead of getting a reef pump? Good. Well, he's also looking at the hardcore $3,000 <clears> bazillion <throat> store model. But yes, definitely. <laughs> 
Exactly. So there's one way to do it. Um, CCS reefing, whatever happened to the nano? The nano, I actually honestly thought the nano would be shut down by now. It is still running. My new tank is up and running, and I've been stealing corals out of it. So I stole my torches out of it and other stuff. So uh, the rock flowers are going to pick my like 10 or so favorites, and they're going to go in the big reef, and the rest are all going in the lagoon. So the lagoon tank beside me, uh, where the Duncan is, that one, I stole all the A-cans out of it last night, actually, and I put them on my big A-can island, and I stole some of the torches out of there, so it's, it's slowly doing this big, like, switcheroo between all the tanks. Um, yeah, so the nano will be slowly fading away, and it will be merging with the other two tanks. Yeah, three or four tanks, getting too crazy, so, cool, two nice tanks. Uh, <laughs> Read that one, there. Which one? Which one are we reading? I of Houston. Houston, we have a problem. I never check my water. Only salinity for the last 15 years. Uh, reasons why I do water change every two weeks. Okay. So, water changes. Lots of people don't worry against them for a while. I think they're starting to come back. But water changes are a big safety buffer. If you, something's going skewed in your tank, if you're building up to something, water changes dilutes it. If you're lacking something, like a trace elements, water changes will help supplement it. Now, you're never going to fully get it all through water changes, but it's going to help lessen the impact of whatever is potentially happening in your tank. So, always a good kind of thing to do. Now, it also depends on what types of corals you have. If you have softies, I mean, water change is probably all you need. LPS, you know, you're kind of in the middle if you have a big aqua tank. You know, the odds are you're, you're going to start going to dosing, whether it be, you know, manually dosing, automated dosing, whatever it is. So it really just depends what you're doing. Um, my nano downstairs, I'm a slacker, hardly ever test it, but I just try and do, you know, my five gallon water change bucket when I can, and it's kept the tank happy. Still gets a couple mils a day on the doser, but yeah, water changes do go a long way for keeping everything pretty happy. I'm not gonna lie, I'm really excited for automating them on the new peninsula. I've been wanting to do this for years, so it's finally gonna happen. Click clacks. Water changes every blue moon. Very frequent, yes, yes. <laughs> uh frequency that's why. Frequency to what? What did we miss in that one? I think it's like frequent like frequent. If you do frequency. Mm, yes. Week. There you go, Ant. Uh, Anthony. I do 25% water change on a 20 gallon. So you do one bucket water change every week and every replenish is enough. Yeah, so it really comes down to what you're keeping in your tank. Um, every coral, every different kind of thing, it's going to consume different elements at a different rate. So you never know what you're missing or lacking unless you test. And that's kind of the moral of the story here, right? You know, it's worth testing because that's what's going to make you successful long term. Whether it's manual or automated, doesn't matter. But you need to do at least somewhat reliable frequency of testing. If you're brand new starting out, you know, weekly is probably a good overall for most people. If you're dosing for the first time or dialing something in, then it should be daily until it's dialed in. Then you can kind of revert back to weekly. And um, some people are hardcore. I know some people that test elk air every single day. Have Manually. you used. <laughs> Have you used natural seawater? I have not. Have you? I've used natural seawater once, and I thought it was good, but I was reading some papers, and it, and it did synthetic salt, natural seawater filtered, and natural seawater. Mm -hmm. And all, like unfiltered natural seawater, which a lot of people go, ooh, unfiltered. So it's just purely out of the sea, straight in the tank. Mm -hmm. And corals grew a lot, lot faster with unfiltered natural seawater because when they did all the tests like under the microscopes, it had these really small virus sized particles in it and the corals feed off them. Probably. I mean, all these little particles <clears throat> are food. Now, I guess there is a risk though. I mean, that you could bring bad stuff into your reef as well, right? Because you never know what you're getting. Oh, true. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, there's probably tons and tons of natural good stuff. If I lived on the ocean, I'd totally be able to be like my bucket. Water change day. Or big big yeah. dosing pumps sucking out whale into the water. But <laughs> I think that's something that someone should do. If it's you, if it's bulk reef supply, to get mm -hmm. natural sea to do a test with synthetic, mm -hmm. natural seawater filtered and natural seawater unfiltered. Yep. To see how corals grow within that would be mm -hmm. a good thing to see. Yeah, no, it would be interesting. I don't know. But the thing is it also depends where you're getting it from, right? Like you could have live in a nice clean source by the water. 
or you could be out in the middle yeah, of nowhere yeah. and you know it could be polluted so it really depends you got to make sure you got you know a reasonably good source of water to pull it from i know some of the people that collect it they go way offshore and get it so if you're if you, you know live on a beach and you're lucky enough to have this little luxurious place then go out and grab your stuff right away good thing is though, all seawater all around the world is within like 0.1% all mm -hmm. the same parameters yeah true be a good way to keep things fairly stable um but yeah i've never tried natural seawater now you're using your ati like instant saltwater mix are you still using that i've been i've used that for the last yep. yeah the last three four water changes i've done mm -hmm. but i think it's a really good quick salt to use yeah nice uh bruno was asking i'll start my 100 gallons really soon what do you think would use of ceramic blocks such as marine pier um i've used that stuff on and off for years I've used the Marine Pier, Brightwell, eShops has their own new one out now. Um, any of those type of ceramic medias, I mean, MaxSpec has one, tons of different companies have them. It is a great way for having a bunch of extra stuff, If you, especially you want the minimalist escape, right? It gives you a lot of bacteria that you can hide in your cell. So that's I, kind of I, where it shines. Yes. I think you can have too much of it. I've had to it's, take some out <laughs> because it was just doing too too good of a job. Fair enough. Um, a big thing that I like too, is if you have some and you're starting a new tank, you can take that medium, put it in and it's going to greatly speed up, like seed your tank and get that good bacteria rolling pretty quick. So if you have more than one tank, you know, or, you know, you're starting or upgrading a new tank soon, get some of those blocks, throw it in your sump and let it be in there for a few months and just seed with all that good life and bacteria. I mean, if you got a bunch of pests in your tank, maybe you don't want to do it, but assuming, you know, you got a nice healthy system, it's a great way to do it. Uh, I live in San Diego and get filtered natural seawater from the Birch Aquarium. That is quite handy. If you got it, that's the perfect way to do it. Yeah. Someone just said that they got there. It was uh, K-Town. Mm -hmm. I tested my salinity, ocean water in Vancouver Island. It was only 1.023. Always test seawater in PPT. Don't test it that way. Mm. Yes. You've got to test it the other way. Because that goes off temperature. So if it's a degree mm -hmm. down, a degree up, that's what it could read. You've got to do it like past per thousand, and it's yep. got to be 35. Mm -hmm. So, um, let me test her. Same thing on this one. You can pick PPT or specific gravity. I used to do specific gravity, but I've went to PPT or no, vice versa. The 35. Yeah, like said, yeah specific whatever. Specific gravity. Yeah. If, it, if it's if it's down uh, a degree. Mm -hmm. It can swing. It can go from one point zero two three to one point zero two two. Yep. It's, that goes purely off temperature. That's mm -hmm. why you've got to use PPT because it can be freezing or it can be boiling, and it'll always be thirty five. Yep. Exactly. Who's on the stream with you? That was Mr. Paul from Reef Community Worldwide. Hey, right, Paul. How are you doing, buddy? <laughs> hello. Hello. I'm hello. Just yep. Me. Um. Animal P, what about dosing Kelkwasser on auto top off? It's a good idea. A lot of people do that to start, and that can actually work very well, especially on lower demand tanks. Um, there is a certain point where if you're addicted to coral, it might not be able to keep up, but a lot of people can dose only Kelkwasser for a long time, and it does work quite well. Now, the other thing is a lot of people will go the Kelkwasser route. One, because it's easy, you just put in your auto top off. So the advantage is you scoop it, you put it in your auto top off, it doses with your evaporation, pretty low maintenance. Now, a couple of little caveats are throughout the year, your auto top off may change, right? As your temperature goes up and down, your tank may evaporate more or less. So that's going to adjust your dosing. So it's not quite as consistent. It also can be a bit harder on your pumps, like your auto top off pump. So you might have to clean a little more often. So those are kind of like the two little downfalls. Now on the plus side, it boosts your pH, which is one reason a ton of people use it. Um, I do see some people sometimes pair with a calcium reactor because with a calcium reactor, you're dripping low pH water into the tank. So then you can counteract it by using super high pH water through the calcwasser solution in your auto top off. So a different way to do it. Now, another kind of way you can do it if you want to be more consistent is use something like a calc reactor. And if you pair that with a dosing pump or somewhere, you can control how much flow goes through it. And that's a really good way to do it. So a few diff different options around that one. Uh, what is going on, guys? Welcome, welcome to the people that just joined. So 
few different options on that one. Um, but Kalkwasser is a very viable solution. It does work quite well, and I've seen tons and tons of successful tanks just using the auto top off. So great way if you're just starting out or if you're having issues and you want to bump your pH up without doing any other kind of crazy drastic ways, then it's a good solution. If you use calc washer and you've got the pump in it, mm -hmm. don't it get clogged up a lot quicker? So it you can. Clean them a lot more. Yeah, you, you, it does take a little more maintenance. You might have to, you know, give it the citric acid or vinegar bath a little more frequently. Um, the other thing is too, if once it settles, it will create a bit of a sludgy bottom on the bottom of your container. Make sure your pump is raised up and you're not sucking up that sludge. You want the clearer solution above it. So you mix it up, make sure it all, whatever settles out, if it doesn't fully dissolve, and then you want to just dose that clear good stuff afterwards. Never used it. I've never, yeah. it's, never, it's never even entered my mind to use it. I tried it for a while, but it, to the point, but then it couldn't keep up. So then I just kind of quit using it. But I did try it for a little while. Uh, Reef is Boss. It, is, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I'm just reading this comment. I uh, love Calc I've been using it for about five months in my ATO. Still waiting for more coral to grow to get a calcium reactor. Beauty. Um, Bill, is it possible to program the Trident slash dose to only dose elk if the result has been verified by a second test? Um, possibly. Terrence is in the chat. He can probably answer that one. I'm saying maybe you might be able to add some kind of a defer to check it, and then maybe you can get it to check again. I don't know. I haven't tried that one. I don't have a Trident, so I can't 100% say, but you could tell it to potentially dose if elk is a certain value. And so it depends on how frequently you test. So Terrence, if, is, Terrence is in the chat. He's in the chat. But if you had a very slow dose and it was based on the previous result, that might work, but it's a bit trickier. Terrence, answer that one if you're still watching. I've got a, a friend in America that's sending mm -hmm. me over the BRS, a special. Hmm. For the, the modder only edition of the Trident? Not yep. Trident. Yep, so it's, coming to, so it's coming to yep. the UK, hopefully. It'll mm -hmm. be the only one in the UK. <laughs> Special edition, <laughs> all right. So it's 150 of them, and one's coming to the UK. Perfect. Worldwide. <laughs> um, I don't have a Trident. What? No, no, I do not. <laughs> so what are you going to use it for? Are you just going to monitor your tank, or are you going to add on to it down the road? What was the question? My question's for you. You said you're getting the BRS edition. Which is oh, yeah, the yeah. no power bar yeah. monitor only edition. Are you gonna add on to it or just keep it strictly for monitoring? I've not. Ne it's never, never, ever tickled my fancy to have a controller in the system, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Woody and Seymour was having a chat secret behind my back, and they organised it, and Seymour ordered it from yeah. the RS, and he's sending it over to the UK to me. Mm -hmm. So Sweet. nice. And I think what you, know, I'll I'll give it a go with a monitor. And then, you know, it's, you can add to it, can't you? So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. so, I get this question a lot. Do you need a controller? No. It's nice to have. Yes. Um, at the very least, if nothing else, I think people should have a heater controller. Um, if you want something cheap and budget, um, Inkbird, hard to beat. BRS has their edition as well. Um, very minimal. If you want to get more advanced, that's where having a controller comes in. Now, two things. So, controller can alert you a thing. So... The first advantage is something goes off in the tank, set an alert. You got to pop up on your phone. Oh, something's off my tank. I got to go take a look at it. So that's the basic. And then, then the next level of it would be to kind of add redundancies and fail saves. So for instance, if my if I put my tank in feed mode, my skimmer will overflow as the water level rises. So I say, if my return pump is off, turn off my skimmer. Or if I use you know Mobius to put my pump in feed mode it'll drop it down and run at a lower speed so i tell the the neptune will say okay if this is running less than 40 watts then turn off my skimmer so it's adding all these little fail safes in and that's where i think a lot of the value of the controller comes in so even on like my heater controller i have two heaters plugged into the brs controller and i have that plugged into a port on the apex so the brs heater controller is turning them off and on taking the wear and tear and if for some reason that ever failed then i have the neptune will turn off power to that port so that one reduces the relay cycles or triax, whatever the heck's in there on the EB832 port, but it's still acting as like that extra level of backup. So a couple different things. So that's where a lot of the value of the controller comes in is all these kind of redundancies and fail safes. Uh, BRS edition was a one-time thing. I can see them coming out a lot more, Terrence, to tell you the truth. 
was sold out too quick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if there's a big enough demand, I mean, there'll probably be more. Yep. Uh, okay, so Taryn said to the previous question about t t the dosing with it. Uh, Tufts type out automatic controlled dosing safely changes dosing really only after one or more tests. Uh, one time, Devin will invite me back. I'll answer these questions for you. Maybe next week, Terrence. Maybe next week we'll do something. This one's almost done for the day, so maybe next week we'll do it up. Uh, okay, a few other questions. Let me scroll back up because I know I missed a bunch. Um, a Wi-Fi power strip should be standard for tanks now. Okay. So Wi-Fi power strips. I know a ton of people that will use smart plugs to control the tank. You want to turn your refugium light on and off. You want to turn your skimmer on and off for water change and stuff. That is great. Very cheap and expensive way to add control to your tank. Now cool. the, the difference between a controller is you can't do it based on inputs. It's basically just a fancy timer or a voice command, right? You can't say, if my water level rises, turn that off because there's at least I don't know of any float switches that are smart home. Like there's a lot of stuff there that's limiting. So it's good for basic automation, but it's not good for backup plan contingency automation. That's the big difference there. You've got to be careful with smart plugs and all, because some of them, when the power goes out, they would they, they automatically won't turn back on as a safety feature. Yep. In case like I had two two of them, one of them would uh, go back to normal functions. The other one wouldn't, which was me ATO was plugged into it. Me, uh, and oh, I can't remember. I think the eater was plugged into it, but no, don't, don't, don't use them. I personally think you shouldn't use them, especially yeah. for ma for major th If it's for a light, like in the mm -hmm. sump, yeah, fair enough. It's like light on, light off in the sump. Yeah. But if you could, do not use it for major things. If that power goes, they will not turn back on. Good to know. I haven't so actually be, tested that with the power outage be thing. Very, very careful with it. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. Um, okay, a couple of people asking how the reef bot was working for me. Uh, so, two caveats here. It has been working. I have not had any issues. It's been working. Now, I only use mine once a week, and this is where I think the reef bot shines, is there's many things that I don't want to test every day. I only care to know once every week or two weeks. I mean, mine tests once a week, but I have it testing magnesium, nitrate, and phosphate, and it does that for me once a week. And I think that's the biggest advantage, is you can tell it what you want to test and how often. So for stuff... Like, or trace elements, stuff that you don't care to know all the time, you just want to know once in a while, or nutrients, then I think that's where the reef bot really shines. Um, okay, what do I got here? Uh, I got the highest wattage BRS heater, both ones a BRS heater controller, with plugged into an Apex DB832. So similar thing, except I don't have crazy high wattage ones. Uh, but, the, why, like, here's one for you. The BRS, mm -hmm. like so, Apex about the BRS one out, which is a which is a monitor. Yeah. What's the difference between that and the Senai? Because to me, the Senai does pH. The Senai does water in water out water, so that tells you water level going up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, this the Senai is a monitor. You can't control no, things. No, yeah, yeah. You can no, only no. be like, okay, the water changed it, or or my tank is hot. You just have to walk over and fix it. That's the difference, right? Where a heater controller will turn it off and fix it for you. Yeah, but I'm saying with the new, like, a special edition one. Mm hmm Because that's just a monitor. Mm hmm So it's virtually the Senai, in a way. True, true. It is Without the... the monthly payment that you've got to do. Monthly yeah. slides. Well, there you go. Saves you monthly money. <laughs> and it doesn't do ammonia. <laughs> but, but it gives you the... The opportunity to extend more if you get more into controllers, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, okay. Since I've seen a bunch of things around the heater and overloading a port, so um, I don't remember what the maximum amperage is or watts is per port on the Neptune power bars. But if you have too big of heaters, you're very potentially overloading that port. So you need to look at whatever the specs are. Terrence answered if you're in the chat. You are. Um, so you need to make sure you're not overloading that port, especially if you're doing like crazy big heaters. I mean, maybe you got to split it up over a couple of ports, but that power bar and those ports have a certain maximum of power that can go through them. So you need to make sure you're not overloading. And this goes for any controller, any plug, any socket. There's only so much power you can safely put through them. So if you're doing crazy big heaters, you might have to divvy it up between two different circuits or two different plugs, that type of thing. Um, there you go, seven amps per port. So. 
I don't know what that works out to in heaters, but make sure you take that into account. Let's split it up. Now, I'm also a big fan of using two smaller heaters rather than one big heater. And because if one heater was to fail on, then it could potentially cook your tank. Where if you have two heaters, if one of them failed on, it's not enough to cook your tank. So it kind of splits up the risk. If one heater dies, the other one can still keep your tank afloat. Um, so that's one of the big things. Bella Reefer, 1499 Super Chat. Woo, thank you, sir. Thank you for all you do. And thank you very much. I appreciate that. Muddy can, muddy can. Um, Terrence, two 800 watt heaters is too much for an outlet. There you go. Or even many people's homes. So definitely split it up. So thank you for that one. Best option is two 300 watt heaters for most common aquariums. That is exactly what I just put on my new tank. So there you go. Perfect. So what else you got on the testing front, Paul? Anything else that you commonly test or think that's more important to test? Number one, salinity slash temperature, because that is a basis for many, many other things. Oh, you're, else... not done phos you're not done phosphates. We haven't even got to nutrients today. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. A whole nother rabbit hole. <laughs> All right, we'll do, we'll do a quick one on this one. Okay, um, so nutrients, depending on what you keep it. I know it's a lot, some people do ultra low nutrients. I like to have some nutrients. Zero is bad for corals because they need them as well to thrive and be happy. So I've always went for, personally, for phosphate. People ask me this all the time, what do you keep them at? I like 0.04 to 0.09 is kind of the happy range in my head. Nitrates, you know, 5 to 20 is a happy range to be. That's personally kind of what I go for. But what about you? We were, talk we were talking about this before, and I, like, I see like an happy range is 0.06, mm -hmm. 0.12. Yep. And I said like between 10 and 20 nitrates, same as. For the non-British, not means zero point. Not, yeah, not yeah, <laughs> zero point. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay, that's been happy range for your tank. Yeah. Well, I think that's the that's the range. Like my, at the minute, I'm I, over the last week, two weeks, I've been running ultra low, so mm -hmm. I'm I'm dosing phosphates and nitrates, but that's the spot I want to get to. Yeah. So I've been like over the last few days, I've been testing by like okay. one mil, two mil, trying to buffer it up, see what I'm getting at. So here's another question. You are dosing nitrates and phosphates to your tank to raise it. Yeah. Why do you do that over either A, feeding more, or B, just exporting less? One, I was, I tried to opening the clarity and turning the skimmer off. Mm -hmm. Just didn't work. It was just, there was just taking them in faster than I could dose them. Mm -hmm. So then I took some bio, like the bio blocks out. Mm -hmm. That just didn't work. I was feeding, and I was feeding, I was feeding. That didn't work. So no matter what I did, the would just not rise. Mm -hmm. So I was I, the way I was seeing it, I was doing more damage by constantly pumping the amount of food that I was doing in. That could be going under rocks, and eventually, one day, it could just blast and every rocks at the same time. So I thought, I'll do it that way, so I could feed normal. I can, and then I'll just dose it like little bits at a time. But I mm -hmm. didn't buy the. I'm not buying the bottles. I just bought the powders, which are a lot, lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. Mixed it myself, and it works out that like you use one mil of this phosphate powder, yep. and it it's costing you zero point zero 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 one cent mm -hmm. for every mil you put in. So okay. it, it's very cheap to to do. No, that's fair. I've ne I've never dosed nitrous and phosphate, and to me, I'm always like, ah, just feed more. So I'm always curious of the justification of going that route and what your reasoning is. So it's good to know. Well, I, yeah, uh, I've just ordered some more refroids. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, that will buffer it up, you yep. know, as I'm doing it, so I can I can do it that way. And do your corals get free food? Well, not free, but they get yeah. food, which makes them happier. Yeah. So I think it's better. Me, me, well, me adding. Phosphates in seem to make the polyp extension go nutty, so I think they like it. That's a good benefit. <laughs> Excellent. All right, guys, we've been on about an hour, and I the wife is texting me for a ride, so I'm going to go pick her up because it's snowing outside. But <laughs> thank you guys for joining today. Uh, sorry for the quick little blip or two of the test kits hitting the mute button on me, but otherwise I think it was a good little chat today. Paul, well, thank you, sir, for coming on. Thank you for having me. All right. All right, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed it. As always, if you did, hit that like button. If you need, make sure to subscribe, and we'll catch you guys on the next video.